Each Friday, we bring you something a little bit different, a podcast from the world of security with our very own Jim Tiller. This is Security Bytes. Hey, what books would you read? My first word out of my mouth is Sun Tzu and the Art of War. I kind of look at you like, what? I go, well, you got to understand how to think, not what to think. This is a cyber warfare, bad guys, you know, how you prepare the battlefield, how you defend, how you attack, all that stuff kind of aligns with how we think in this world and thinking like the bad guy. Welcome to Security Bites. A weekly show where we cover interesting cybersecurity news from the week. And then we're joined by a leading cybersecurity expert to discuss today's pressing business and technical challenges of security. Join me, your host, Jim Tiller. Brought to you by and powered by Nash Squared. Let's get started. In this week's news, I want to cover off on three things. And a matter of fact, it's really more of making you aware of a few things. First and foremost, there was a survey done recently of about 550 companies that expressed that the cost of data breaches is going up by about 13% year over year. The global average is now 4.4 million with 9.4 million average in the United States. The average days to detect and respond to an event dropped from 287 to, well, 277, so not much of a difference there. And interestingly, 83% of companies surveyed said they had more than one breach. So generally, it just does go to show you that things are not exactly getting better. It's actually kind of dismal. The interesting dynamic that is occurring is how the cost of cyber attacks are being passed down. So get this, 60% of respondents said they increased pricing to accommodate for the cost of a cyber breach. So we deal with this in normal economic scenarios. For example, take today's inflation, the scarcity of fuel, fuel price increases, that affects various companies, whether it be shipping or whatever, and all that stuff gets passed down to the consumer. Now we have cybersecurity impacts being passed down to the consumer. Very interesting perspective. One more thing I thought I would add uh, that included in this report, just as an interesting piece of information was is around the industrialization of cybercrime, which is a big topic for me, but it talks specifically around the time it takes on average to perpetrate a ransomware attack. As an example, over the last three years, that average has been around the two month mark. Well, in this report, it had dropped 94% down to less than four days. So that means what was taking months now takes days. And we're seeing that how there's a drop in the barrier to getting attacked. So instead of making it seemingly more difficult. It seems to be really, really easy. The impacts are obviously getting greater. We're not really finding them and dealing with them at any faster rate. And more than 80% of companies are getting hacked more than once. Not a lot of good things to share there. Next up is we're gonna talk about the weaponization of spyware. In general, just wanna talk about things like Pegasus from the NSO group or Devil's Tongue from Jindiru. These are weapons grade spyware type of applications that you can get as organizations, governments, NGOs, groups, people, you name it. If you have enough money, get your hands on it. So what does this mean? This means that now systems that were developed for very aggressive type of activities like spying are now available to your average person for the right amount of money. Even though organizations like NSO, NSO Group says they don't sell to individuals or groups, they only sell to the government. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, these things are still out there. Hacker tools can get very expensive. There's been an economy for hacker tools for, well, decades. Just look up Zeus. The point being is, is these are very, very impactful and we're starting to see them all over the place. So it now it starts to begin the question of, are we in a new type of arms race? I mean, think about nuclear proliferation in a post-World War II era leading to the Cold War and then governments and organizations trying to work together to minimize, you know, who has access to weapons of such destructive nature. Now, I'm not saying cyber weapons are like nuclear weapons, but in a world where pretty much everything runs on cyber, it does make one start to think. Okay, the last quick one is around 
dealing with network services as a hacker. A lot of these organizations, cybercrime, cyber criminal organizations, use a vast network of service providers and other types of services to perform these types of cyber crimes. It is a large cyber criminal ecosystem. One of those long-standing hacker enabling networks called 911.re was recently shut down, ironically, by getting attacked where they had a bunch of servers destroyed and customer data deleted and things of that nature and basically just got out of the business. Well, this is right on the heels of other hacker organizations that provide network services like VIP72 and Luxox. They were shut down by authorities. So now there's a, a hole in the, in the hacker community or the cybercrime ecosystem where these ransomware as a service, spam, other types of network heavy type of hacking capabilities are now being pulling back. And of course, alternatives are popping up. But as soon as these new networks come up, they're being overwhelmed with subscribers. So it's a really interesting view of these cybercrime community. So I believe there's a lot of organizations and people that still think, well, we're just dealing with, you know, a hacker or the other end of the spectrum. It's a nation state. It's so big and so nasty. We can't really deal with it. But I think there's a huge piece in the middle. There is this perspective, a lone hacker in a hoodie hunched over a laptop, which is long dead. We need to start looking at a completely different picture. Think of a very large global organization with various divisions, leaders, partners, affiliates, and very diverse and effective banking and financing capabilities. We have to understand that these are global organizations perpetrating these crimes. And it's just an interesting peeking into that environment when we see their networks being brought down either by hackers or in a couple of cases with law enforcement, which is excellent. And then we find ourselves looking at that, that organization struggling when their network services go down. And that's this week's news on Security Bytes. This week, I am super excited to have a really old friend and former colleague. He is the CTO of Lumu, which provides advanced network detection response services. A very, very warm welcome to a very old friend, Jeff Wheat. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Thanks, Jim. And thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to, to catch up with you and just kind of, you know, shoot the breeze and talk about what we always talk about, which is security and the, the state of the industry. That's it. That's it. One of the things I was thinking about and leading up to this is when we met and you really made a really heavy impression on me when I first met you. It was great. I never forget the when and the where. It was 1997. We were at an event for the company we were both working for at the time, INS, International Network Services. It was in Florida and you were so welcoming. You were a principal. I mean, you were one of 20 in, a, in an organization had 2000 consultants. So you were the killer and you spent a lot of time with me and really was part of that core community that really made me the security professional I am today. So huge. Thank you for that. And uh, it's been really great. Do me a favor. Walk me through how you got into security. Mine's a kind of a weird, you know, you can see the gray hair. So, you know, I tell my kids that, you know, I, I predate the internet and cell phones, which is true. Um, I was working in the Department of Defense. And of course, as you know, DARPA invented the internet, them and Al Gore, right? So the, the system I was a solutions engineer or a systems engineer on was basically implementing the OSI model be, between mainframes. So, you know, I was, I was down in the, in the bits, right? You know, it was like, designing it, you know, maintaining it, managing it, both the hardware and the software sides for all the OSI levels. So, and it's really helped me throughout my career because whenever I evaluated new technology, you know, we're the land of three letter acronyms, right? You know, whenever I evaluate a new technology, it's like, okay, where does it fit? What's the service? What's the, what's the problem it's trying to solve? You know, that classic systems engineering root cause analysis type uh, environment. And just kind of naturally drew me into the security side because, you know, you were always, we were at a grassroots level where, you know, not only the communication, but you had to protect it from, you know, from exploit and whatever else. So it, it just became kind of a natural growth pattern into the security space. And I just was, started off doing that with the Department of Defense. And then, you know, of course, then I ended up with the company you mentioned, which I'm very proud of. 
which is INS, as a principal. And one of the things that, you know, I always brag about the INS experience is as a principal, I, I, I equate it to the, the homecoming queen, right? You know, the staff get a vote and the, the students get a vote. Well, at INS, it was brilliant because not only did management choose us to be those principals, the people that we led, those engineers and those practices that we led also had that vote. So that, you know, I wear that like a badge of honor. You know, I always kind of have a saying, you know, I treat my customers, my employees, my customers, students, whatever, as friends until they become friends. And it's always been kind of a moniker of mine, you know, so it, it served me well. You know, I've got maintained long-term friends like yourself throughout the years. You know, I, we call it the, the INS mafia because we you know, were thick as thieves because that was such a great experience that we were able to pull throughout our careers and, you know, turn around and help each other out along the ways and bounce ideas off of people. You know, whenever I have a hard problem, I call you, you know, it's like, you know, I call others within the INS, you know, cabal. So, and, and throughout their career. So that's, that's been a huge asset to me throughout my career. And I hope, you know, you and I have been assets to others in their careers as well. The INS mafia is a, it is a great, place to have worked and you see practices pop up in various organizations because of that sort of pollination if you will some of those strategies around taking care of your people you bring up a very specific point and really kind of gets to the heart of what i wanted to talk to you about today and it really is a combination of you know mentorship advisory connecting with people collaboration within the umbrella of cybersecurity and what we're dealing with today, which is the cybersecurity skills gap, or shall we say the availability of security professionals relative to the demand. So I'll start off with a survey that came out recently, surveyed about a thousand professionals worldwide. And what stood out to me was roughly 28% said they're actually gonna get out of the industry in the next couple of years. So it makes you think about cyber burnout. Then you compare that to multiple types of reports that speak to anywhere from 2.7 to 3.5 million current unfilled cybersecurity jobs. I guess I'm just gonna start off with is, what is some of the advice that you would give to people moving into this career in cybersecurity? What are the kind of the key things that they need to be thinking about? And then from that, we'll talk more about what's going on in the industry, and then what can companies do to better, you know, help identify resources they really need? Okay. First, let's, you know, first it's systems engineer, right? Let's do the root cause analysis. What, you know, why is that? You know, it's a high stress, you know, high environment, you know, overworked, underpaid. I don't know about the underpaid anymore, but, but definitely overworked kind of environment. When you think about, I always use the analogy, you know, the security people are like the referees or the umpires in a game. You only know their name if something goes wrong. It's like no one remembers the the umpire in the World Series unless they blew the World Series call. It's kind of the same with cyber. The security guy, you know, we're, how do you prove a negative? If you're doing your job, nothing happens. Well, how do they know that's not just dumb luck? <laughs> Having the ability to prove you're doing your job is is part of the challenge is it's kind of a thankless job. So we kind of fit that space. So there's a little bit of that. You know, I think that's part of, you know, some of the burnout, you know, the CISO, it used to be CISOs like us, for example, you know, used to be able to, you know, okay, you're the whipping boy. We got hacked. You know, you've been asking for the, uh, the funding and stuff to do it. Told me it's going to happen. doesn't matter. You're still going to feel the blame. So you just jump over to the next job from the lap from a CISO who got let go of that job. Well, once they started actually naming the CISOs in the financial suits, the CISOs started going, whoa, wait a minute. You know, it's one thing for me to be the designated whipping boy. It's another for me to lose my house because you guys wouldn't pay for security. And that that started to change the game a little bit. And I think, you know, you're starting to see a little bit of burnout on the CISO end of it. The other side is to get people into this industry. And I, I've, I've I've done a lot of talking. I'm on a part of a thing in Kansas City called Enterprise KC on the board where we're working with the local community college. Which community college is a, the anchor point of any community. Not everyone needs to go get a four year degree like you and I. Right. You know, it's like it, we still need them. And I recommend they get them because, you are you know, you're going to have to tick the box to get through the glass ceiling later on in your career. But to, to enter into this environment does not require a four year degree. You and I have talked about this. When we hire, we look for attitude and aptitude. 
I can work with anything like that. You know, it's just like if, if they have that natural curiosity, because this environment changes. You know, people ask me and you, hey, what books would you read? My first word out of my mouth is Sun Tzu and the Art of War. And they kind of look at you like, what? I go, well, it's you got to understand how to think, not what to think. This is a cyber warfare, bad guys, you know, how you prepare the battlefield, how you defend, how you attack. All that stuff kind of aligns with how we think in this world and thinking like the bad guy. And then, you know, lean into all the stuff that's dynamic on the web in terms of learning those associations, you know, be next to peers like yourself where you, you can just absorb that. Because in most cases in our industry, you know, I, I think there's a very strong mentorship environment. If anyone ever comes to me and asks me to be a mentor for them, I've never said no. And I tell that to young people. First thing you do, get there, find a mentor. I was lucky enough that growing up, I had good managers and I had good people that mentored me that, you know, kind of got me through some of those youth and exuberance or, or arrogance or whatever to get through and actually evaluate problems, you know, present both sides of the argument, all those kind of things that just move you through not only the technical skills, but the social skills. To, to work as a team, because this is a team sport. It, you can't do it by yourself. It has to be a team environment. Positive side of drawing people in, I was just talking at a conference about this. So what other industry can you be the white knight, you know, the, the knight in shining armor, roll up, fend off bad guys, save, you know, save the company, save whatever, and no one's shooting at you. There's instant gratification of, of, you know, stopping an attack, stopping a, you know, an attempt or whatever. You don't have to wait six months for, you know, a project to be done or whatever. It's instantaneous when you think about threat analysts. So, so now why do we have so many open slots? Well, part of it is, you know, I I talked about Casey Enterprise and Lumu also has a program going with uh, Miami-Dade College that's trying to draw in, you know, that local talent and keep it local. Look, when I was at University of Kansas, NSA showed up and took me out, right? You know, I, back before anyone had heard of them, including me, I thought they were NASA. They don't have a sense of humor about that. But um, anyway, <clears throat> you know, getting that local talent to stay local, you know, getting them job ready so they came out. So we worked with the, uh, the local at Dave College through Lumu and at Enterprise KC in Kansas City to work with those universities to provide the type of instruction that would make them job ready when they came out. And one of the things we align that with is aligning them, you know, in, in the tracks with the certifications that are available. So when you came out, you didn't just have a degree in computer science or whatever it was. You also were ready to take, you know, pick a certification, CISSP or something, but, you know, CIH, you know, a number of the different certifications, just get that right. So they come out, they can walk straight into as an incident handler, as a pen tester, you know, they're taking the OSCP, you know, a number of those different certifications that say, I'm not only do I have this understanding of how to think that the universities are really good at, and that's what, that's why Western universities are so coveted because we don't, totally focus on the rote memorization because in security, I can't give you a clipboard to tell you what the bad guys are going to do tomorrow. I can tell you what they did yesterday, but you got to, you got to think ahead on the chessboard, just like they are. If you're going to attack something, think how would I attack it? Real quickly, you said something interesting. There was a time, and I know an early, certainly in my career where there's a lot of emphasis on certification. And then there was a, a trough where we just, you know, there's more than 420 industry certifications for cyber right now. And I think there was a point in time where it's like you kind of got in sort of alphabet soup issues. But it's very interesting for you to hear is that combining, say, maybe a two-year degree with certification actually elevates you more quickly and gives you more opportunities because you're tuned in to what's going on. Is is that a true statement? Yeah, it is. And the way I pitch it to employers and stuff, I look at this, if if they're coming out with the certification and that educational background, English, math, how to communicate, you're going to be writing reports, all those kind of things, you know, you, so you, you polish them, but when they come out with that practical experience, you know, it's like, you know, if you're going to take a threat analyst that has been through those certifications, you took them straight out of high school and said, all right, smart individual, just doesn't, can't afford, doesn't want to, whatever, do the degree. Let's put them in the threat intel space, put them in a SOC, junior analyst, side seat them, all that kind of stuff. But if they've got those certifications, think even red team stuff. You know, if they understand how to, how to red team and go after a system, that's like two to four years experience. I mean, and you got it straight out. 
you know, and we encourage, you know, the, the double side of what we were doing in you know, Enterprise KC is we were putting the employer's skin in the game, too, because they're saying, OK, how many if we do this, how many of these people will you take on as interns? And, you know, Luma is doing that with Dade College. We're doing, you know, it, it, it's win win. We get to it's like a two year interview process with the, the candidate. We get to, you know, we get to show them how awesome Lumu is in this case. You know, that, hey, don't you want to come work for us because it's a competitive job market. And we, you know, we've been a part of their training to be functional with what we do. So, you know, it's win, win, win. It's win for the student. It's win for the college. Good for the community. You're keeping people who are engaged in that, you know, grew up in that community there. You know, you're growing those jobs and then the, the, the industry is getting, you know, in Kansas City, we have 4,500 to 5,000 open security racks at any one time, you know, so you're starting to solve that problem. The other side is to go for those untapped market, you know, 90% of people in security look like you and I, right? You know, how do we get women into the market? You know, how do we tap into the minorities? You know, you got to get to them early, get the STEM in there early. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, as much as, you know, I like STEM and math and science, and whatever, not everyone else does. And, you know, you don't need the high level math to be able to be a threat analyst. So, you know, it, it's there. there's a place for everything. You don't have to have a four year degree to get into this. And, and, there, and it shouldn't require that because, you know, in our industry, out of the IT world, how many of the router and, and switch guys, they didn't have degrees. They were the guys who went to high school that were bored in the back of the class because they're extremely intelligent and they weren't challenged right they don't yeah they don't see the need for all those other classes and stuff you covered a lot of points and i want to take a moment to touch on a couple of them because they they really resonate with me you mentioned things like natural curiosity and i and i thought immediately of thinking critically also the desire to share and collaborate i've said many times that the cybersecurity industry, doing it as a professional is a little bit like being on a crazy train. It's constantly moving. It's total madness, absolute chaos. And, and I'll take a moment to go back to a very early point that we were talking about concerning like cyber burnout. And it's not just that alert scenario, but it's also you're fighting against other people in some ways, right? You have these adversaries mm -hmm. and you're on the defense at times, and that that creates a different type of mental pressure. But I also wanted to touch on what you just said with regards to the employee side of the that equation. And later, I want to come back and talk more tactically about, for people who are listening to this, how can they find those types of programs and universities and things like that? Because I, I think it's very attractive, and getting it out there is difficult. But let's talk about the employer side, okay? In one sense, I could argue that the cybersecurity industry, the profession itself, has become very specialized. I mentioned earlier there's over 400, 420 plus cybersecurity certifications that are out there. In addition to, there are people, for all the right reasons, who have become very good at an aspect of security that is like threat hunting, security research, vulnerability research, reverse engineering malware, understanding risk or compliance, hyper specialization, which of course then reflected in some degrees in the certifications that are out there. I think security takes a lot of kind of disciplines to do it really, really well. So how do we juxtapose that? First of all, is that a reality in your eyes? How do we juxtapose that with organizations that say, hi, I have all these open positions to the point we've been making, but the job description says you have to have these 4,700 different types of skills that have no relation to one another and 10 years experience. And oh, by the way, we're going to pay you 50 grand a year. It just seems like there's a little bit of an education that needs to happen into the consumers of cybersecurity specialists and be able to tie that back into how do we best advise people getting into the career? So big question for you. Yeah. Got a couple, and, and you covered a couple of things. One, what you're talking about that, you know, tick all these, you know, humans are lazy. Humans love to tick boxes. You know, recruiters are looking at 10,000 deals. They, they're looking for a way to minimize it to a thousand. It's what I call the recruiter lobby. At some point, you're going to have to understand what the, the primary certification for the field you want to get into, the position you want to get into. You know, if it's like ours as a system, CISSP is a must. You're, you're not even going to get a call back if you don't have that. 
fair or not fair or whatever. It's the way, you know, I, I wouldn't be um, advised properly if I didn't tell you that wasn't the case. You know, you know, it just is. So if you want to be a, you know, a pen tester, I want to be a pen tester. I said, okay, OSCP, you know, or something equivalent. You just have to understand the, the base that they're going to do that tick the box for you. So, you know, and, and you will learn from it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not devaluing it. I'm saying it's just the way it is. And part of that is, like you said, you know, the, the recruiting staff out there or the companies you're working for that aren't in our field don't understand all the things they just asked for and said, you know, that'd take me 20 years to get that. And you're asking for that in a two year day. Really? How, how many months has that been up on the job board? <laughs> you know, yeah, so it, it's you know there there needs to be that there there needs to be some ownership you know that you know maybe they're halfway to what you need and you, you're going to get them the other half, and that's how you retain people. Not only it's not only about money, you know it's about it's about their careers. If you come here, here's what we're going to do, you know. And if you're at that lower end, you're paying the lower end. You're just gonna there's going to be turnover. You're going to keep them as long as you can. Uh, threat analysts on a soccer is a prime example. Put a junior analyst on there, start them at, they usually start 50, 60,000, which is great coming out of high school or whatever, you know. If they've shown the aptitude and at, attitude, by that I mean the curiosity, you know, they, they've researched stuff on their own. They didn't just show up and expect you to do everything for them. That's not going to work. You know, there has to be some of that self driven that you're looking for. You know, you're going to kind of be able, it, it's about how they think. You know, I always call it game theory, which is probably a wrong use of the word, but in, in, in terms of, I'm going to game it out. It's like if, whenever I'm thinking of ways of solving a problem, it's like, well, you could do A or you could do B, you could do C. Each one has its pros and cons. Or, you know, or if I'm watching a, a thread, I'm going, well, it could be this, but it also might be this. And eventually I get down to it's the zombie apocalypse or whatever, you know, the, the 10%, you know, at the end, right. You know, I'm that guy that goes that far, but you know, so that sort of thinking that doesn't get in, in a silent, what I call instrument lock. Oh, it has to be this. Well, no, it might actually be that they've actually hacked the endpoint protection system. <laughs> you know, that happens, you know, don't discount it. It's, it's a lower percentage. But, you know, if you if you keep the open mind that it might be, I joke about the zombie apocalypse, you know, World War Z reference. If you keep that open mind, that's when you find the zero days because the zero days aren't on the clipboard. That's what I mean by the clipboard. You know, it's like, OK, this happened yesterday. OK, great. You know, that's that's not today. So here's a build on that theme. We talk about. The characteristics you mentioned, you don't have to know, you know, math and science to get into this. Mm -hmm. You have to think critically. You have to think like yeah. a bad guy. Right. All those elements speak to the art of cybersecurity. Right. And I see a lot of cybersecurity professionals as artists. I mean, many of them are musicians and do really interesting things outside of their careers that demand that kind of thinking. But I find equally so in organizations, they look for somebody to bring in from a cybersecurity perspective. And let's say they finally hire somebody and it's the right person. And then they stick them in a chair and forget about them. And that type of person who has these characteristics, who's willing to challenge and fight against their adversary, it's a job that requires continual learning, nonstop education or educating yourself. And we take that type of person and we put them in a position that doesn't have that outward, not just upward, but outward mobility to move from an analyst into pen testing or threat intelligence or research, or even begin to get into risk and compliance or whatever direction they wish. Do you find a lot of organizations struggle with creating a career map for cybersecurity people and they are not embracing that the core fundamentals of what makes people really good cyber people. I, I do, and and here's partially why we're we're kind of we're kind of on a stick in a lot of organizations. Um, you know, if it's an organization like mine that's a security company, there's tons of upward mobility. But say you're in Joe's Donuts or Acme Manufacturing, you're you're those crazy guys that use the three letter acronyms, and there's no positions above you. You know, unless it's going to go to you know, CTO or CIO, and a lot of times that 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 is CTO of a, a construction company, someone who's you know highly technical in construction usually. So that's a challenge. 
Um, now, in, in environments like mine, I'm, I, you know, I run large socks and everything else. The first thing I asked him, you know, all right, you're the Palo Alto guy. What else do you want to learn? You know, what do you mean? I go, I, I, what else do you want to learn? What do, what do you want to grow? Do you want to learn Zscaler? Do you want to learn, you know, do you want to learn Lumu? Do you want to learn, you know, what do you want to do? And they go, you'll do that for us? Yeah, of course. I said, it's it's win-win for me. I, I want to bolster your career to keep you around. You know, I've, I've got to do more than just money to keep you around because someone can always pay more. I want you to enjoy it here. I want you to grow. But, you know, if, if my Zscaler guy or Lumu guy goes down, you're my backup. And what I'm also kind of challenging there is I'm saying, how curious are they? Yeah, I'm finding my top performer, you know, kind of like you know, I learned a lot from INS on how we grew people up through the senior to the principal. You know, I helped people get to senior level. And then, you know, I remember I had one go, well, okay, now, you know, okay, now how do I get to principal? I go, no, you don't understand. My job was to help to help you get to senior. Principals get themselves to principal. That's the different skill set is you've got to think for the organization. You got to think how to grow the organization, how to reach back and help others. You know, I, I got here because you guys, you know, voted me in. I did that by taking care of the people behind me, not taking care of myself. Servant leaders, right? You know, it's the classic embodiment of servant leaders. So I'm always kind of looking for how people think, you know, how they take care of their others. You know, are they, you know, is it a team environment? Because, you know, a lot of times we are on our own island. I call it kind of environments I try and build is where everyone's fighting for the person in the foxhole next to them. You know, when something comes in on Christmas Eve at four o'clock and we get hit with an instant, which happens, all of a sudden Christmas just got canceled. Well, if I'm just going to tell them Christmas is canceled, then I'm just a bad guy. But if it's like, hey, look, you know, you, you're going to make Jim stay here by himself. No one's going to let that happen. Right. You know, because Jim's our buddy. Now nah, we're in here with you. You know, if you're missing Christmas, we're, we're missing it with you. That's how you build strong, effective teams. Right. And then, you know, as a leader, leaders are shields. Right? Always defend your people. And, you know, it's like I got a rule. I just don't like being shot through the same hole twice. You know, if we make a mistake. I'll take it. You know, but let's let's make sure we don't do that again. You know, if I keep getting shot through the same hole, then then I'll have a problem. With it. You know, how do you grow that? You know, I, I think you grow it in term, and you know, you just have to accept the fact that you may educate them out of your organization. But, you know, that's OK. You know, you can't hold on. You know, think about think, you know, think of yourself. Would you want to be like now if I'm happy to be think about it, you probably don't want someone that wants to just sit in that organization for 20 years because they're all they're complacent. If they're complacent, they're probably not doing what you and I do to, to see what the threat, the new TTP that came in today. If they don't have that natural curiosity and growth, they're not they're not protecting you very well anyway. I think that's a very good point because organizations, whether they know it or not, play a certain part in the in the journey of a cybersecurity professional. So if you're an organization that does X. That's where you fit within that journey, that spectrum of letters of X, Y, Z and all that kind of stuff. And people will grow into that capability and by nature, they will grow out of it. So I think companies can be a big help in mentoring and driving and understanding to your point exactly that people will grow out of your company because you're filling a certain spectrum within the arc of their journey, which is a very different type of scenario in other types of careers. Jeff, one of the things that I think is worth talking about with this quote unquote shortage of security capabilities and resources, the talent shortage, shall we say, there are some that believe it's a myth. There's some that believe it's even worse. We've had a little bit of a conversation around mentoring people and identifying opportunities as well as working with organizations to search more effectively for the right people that they're looking for. But from the perspective of just dealing within the level of, say, security analysts, what do you believe is the approach from a broader perspective we should also be looking at? Well, you know, you've heard the term push the needle out of the haystack. I use the term push the needle out of the needle stack. You know, we don't have a data problem. We have a too much data problem. You're not doing anyone any favors by just giving them more data. You've got to give them some sort of response, automated response. So, you know, I think the the realm that we're moving into is the the realm of uh, you know, SOAR and or, you know SOAR, 
orchestration and automation. I think you're going to have to do that. You have a perfect storm of there's not enough people out there. There's people leaving the industry, as you mentioned before. And, and now you're going to give them more tools that just take even more of their time. I mean, security individuals, part of the reason they're leaving is they're working 60, 80 hour weeks. So if you think of operational efficiency, that's what you need to get to. And I think that's part of the problem with the industry right now, because time is everything. You know, you're trying to narrow the space that the bad guy can operate in and narrow the time frame in which they can operate in. You know, from the DOD parlance that you and I come from, that's called getting them into the kill zone. Uh-huh. So when they when they move, they're really easy to spot and they're really easy to finish, right? So that's that's what we're trying to do in the in the environment. And like I say, this is a team event. And there you go, is it also begins to answer several big challenges and questions. One, it helps with the skills gap through automation. Right. It helps also with the specialization around cybersecurity, right. okay? Because now you actually need specialists once you've dealt with sort of the bulk of the work. And it sort of solves that upward mobility and expanse for security professionals. So really the message is here is focus on automation let computers do what they do best and let humans do what they do best. So one is good at crunching numbers and one is really good at thinking critically. I got to tell you, this has been fantastic. And for everyone listening, Jeff brings a wealth of knowledge. I just happened to want to talk to him today about what it means to, to mentor people because I've personally felt it. I've seen it. Uh, and I know he's very much involved with his community. So Jeff, it's been amazing. Thank you so much for joining. You're welcome, Jim. Anytime, brother. Anytime you call, I'll pick it up. Yeah. Car breaks down, I'll bring a tire and gas. So you know how that goes. You know, that's it. Well, again, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who's listening. Join me next time on Security Bites.